Good afternoon. Well, I'm joined by General Fruin, Coordinator General of the COVID Vaccine Task Force. He, together with the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Professor Paul Kelly, uh, the Secretary of the Federal Treasury, uh, Dr Stephen Kennedy and myself, uh, held a business roundtable. And we were joined by more than 30 of Australia's leading CEOs and representatives of Australia's leading industry representative groups. CEOs from Coles, from the Commonwealth Bank, from Telstra, West Farmers, Virgin, Qantas and many other companies were present for this uh, virtual discussion. It was a very important discussion and it continues the strong cooperation that we have seen between the federal government and the business community from day one of this pandemic. Last year, we partnered with the business community to provide rent relief, mortgage relief to millions of Australians, as well as to ensure that our supply chains were resilient when states went into lockdown and when the pandemic was at its peak. The support of the business community has been extremely important in Australia's strong economic recovery, a recovery which has seen our unemployment rate come down to 5.1 per cent, with 115,000 jobs created in the month of May, which has seen economic growth faster than even the most optimistic expectations of Treasury and the Reserve Bank, and which has seen Australia ahead of any advanced economy around the world have more people in work today than before the pandemic and our economy bigger today than before the pandemic. But today's cooperation with the business community came as we moved into a new phase of, a, uh, of our COVID response and in particular the acceleration of the rollout of the vaccine. More than eight and a half million jabs have been delivered across Australia. And as you know, we have focused on the most vulnerable cohorts in the community, with more than 70% of Australians aged over 70 receiving their jab, more than 50% of Australians aged over 50, and more than 30% of the eligible Australian community receiving their first jab. Um, this is a number that will only increase as more supply comes online, as you know, we're, we've got about 300,000 mRNA Pfizer vaccines coming in each week. That will increase to around 600 to 700,000 by the end of July and into August. And then the expectation is around 2 million by October. And this is where the involvement of the Australian business community will be so important. And today we discussed how we can cooperate on issues such as transport, logistics, premises, community engagement, as well as communications. It was agreed by all members present that businesses will write to all their workers about the importance of being vaccinated. And in some cases, we'll be reaching out to their customer base. The Commonwealth will work with the business community about that particular message. For example, Alan Joyce, the CEO of Qantas, talked about how he has 13 million frequent flyers and over 22,000 workers. We heard from the Minerals Council how their businesses, their members, reach out into Indigenous communities in the remotest parts of Australia and how they're willing to work with us to get that message about how important it is to vaccinate. There were many offers of premises for vaccinations being rolled out, including from West Farmers that raise the opportunities that could be provided at your local Bunnings or your local office works. There was extensive discussion about a whole range of issues. It was a very productive, constructive meeting. And Treasury will be following up with all the members involved because we not only discussed the opportunities where we can work together, but also some of the barriers that may be in the way right now for, from preventing the business community from playing a greater role. And I want to emphasise that this is the first of a number of meetings 
that we will be having with the business community as we seek to meet the challenges created by this virus. And General Fruin will, will talk to, to that. So I think today was a very positive step and I thank the business community for their active involvement. It was at a very high level. Uh, it was something that the Prime Minister and I were very keen to occur and it builds on the very extensive, cooperative, constructive business government relationship that we've had from day one of this pandemic. General Fruin. Uh, thank you, Treasurer. I do think this was a very important meeting and it was heartening to see industry's commitment to supporting uh, the vaccination rollout. Uh, there were a range of initiatives discussed uh, and a, a range of support offered from industry and these included things such as workplace vaccination, uh, offers of workforce support, uh, access to venues um, and support in uh, promulgating that important message about encouraging Australians to get vaccinated. Uh, in turn, I've offered to bring industry more closely into our planning process uh, and I've offered to run an activity to brief them more fully on our plan uh, in line with the sort of wargaming activity that we did yesterday with the states and territories. But I think overall this will be a very powerful partnership going forward in helping us continue to keep people safe, uh, to protect people's livelihoods and to allow us all to return to the freedoms we wish to enjoy. Thank you, Andy. Mark. You spoke this morning of possible incentives for people to be vaccinated in the workplace. What, what might, might they be? And also, um, have you decided now on financial assistance for New South Wales? There's some concerns there that $350 and $500 a week might be enough to cover mortgages and rents in that city. Well, there are two questions there. So let me just deal with the first one because I know then uh, that General Fruing can add to that in terms of the timing of the incentives. Yes, there was extensive discussion about it, uh, but that also goes to how quickly we get that additional supply online as to when those incentives are best put to effect. But yes, a number of businesses raised some very interesting uh, and exciting ideas about how they can put their resources to work. Well, um, I, I mean, Airlines, we're talking about free frequent flyer points and, and, and other benefits, for example. Um, I think it's more than a snag at Bunnings if you, or, um, that we're talking about as, a, uh, as potential opportunities for, for incentives. But the timing mark of those incentives are very important. With respect to New South Wales, and I note the uh, announcement by um, the Premier, um, the first thing to say is we are providing the same support to New South Wales in this lockdown than we did to Victoria just weeks ago. And that is where there is a lockdown that extends beyond one week in a designated hotspot. The payments of $500 and $325 are available. And as you know, the $500 payment is the same quantity or the same quantum that was provided when JobKeeper ended in March. And that's important. Um, the Treasurer of New South Wales has written to me asking for the reinstatement of JobKeeper. We're not bringing back JobKeeper. Uh, we had, that was an emergency support payment that we introduced at the height of the pandemic. We then uh, extended it beyond the initial six months to 12 months. We brought in a tiered payment to take into account the number of hours that were work, worked. Uh, and that JobKeeper payment played a very important part in our economic recovery and particularly keeping that formal connection between employers and employees. And I don't need to remind you, Mark, that since the end of JobKeeper, the unemployment rate has actually come down to 5.1 per cent. What we did anticipate in the budget just weeks ago was that there would be further lockdowns and there would be further outbreaks. And that's why we kept our foot to the accelerator with $41 billion in direct COVID economic support. But it was a more targeted and a different support than in that initial emergency phase. We also had an agreement through National Cabinet that the federal government would provide that income support in the event of future lockdowns and state governments would provide the business support. Now in Victoria, um, Tim Pallas announced around $450 million of additional business support. Dominic Perrottet has announced up to $10,000 payments for businesses. And I note that the Premier today has said that they will give further consideration as to what additional economic support. But we're not about to bring back JobKeeper. That was an emergency 
support payment that had an initial time frame. And as you know, uh, we expected that there would be further lockdowns and we do have payments available for people. General Fluent, just to add on at that point about so incentives. I think you, you asked about specific uh, incentives. Well, as an example of where industry might come further into play, we talked about work place vaccination. Now, workplace vaccination won't be for every workplace, and it won't be immediately. There will be a time in the year when we have the, the adequate supplies to support workforce vaccination. But in the, either in the meantime, uh, industry have offered up workforce perhaps to support administration around setting up other pathways for vaccination. And in the fullness of time, they have workforces that may support their own workplace vaccination that they would offer up for vaccination more broadly. When it comes to uh, incentives, uh, right now the key message is vaccination is the right thing to do and people should be getting out and getting vaccinated uh, and I think industry uh, have committed to supporting us in that messaging. Uh, but we will look at a range of incentives and how they might support incentivisation. But again, I think that's for a time later in the year when we get beyond the immediate. Uh, David, 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 on the incentives, Treasurer, you mentioned that the incentives depend on supply. What have you done and what can you do to increase the supply of vaccines to Australia? For instance, the United States administration under Joe Biden is exporting Pfizer to Canada. I don't think it's exporting to Australia. Why not? Can you raise that with your counterparts? Have you raised it with any of your global counterparts to see if Australia can get vaccine supply more of it sooner from the European Union and from the United States? Well, the Prime Minister and the Health Minister have been very focused on ensuring that we continue to secure that supply, and we have agreements to get more Pfizer and mRNA vaccines into Australia. And we had the Chief Medical Officer at the meeting today who spoke about that additional supply that is coming on online, and I, me and I mentioned the two million in October. I have not spoken to my counterparts directly. I was meeting yesterday with my counterpart from Indonesia, and we did discuss how our two countries can work together in the face of COVID. And as you know, David, we are providing vaccines into our region to support some of those countries that do not uh, have ready access like we do, for example, to the AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, we continue to secure as much supply as we can. We continue to have discussions with those major companies. Are we not paying enough? Are we not paying enough? for Pfizer and Moderna. Is that why other countries are getting their vaccine supply before us? Well, it's, I don't think it's an issue of paying enough. In fact, as you know, we have put more than $7 billion to work in terms of the vaccine uh, distribution as well as um, the acquisition of the vaccine. Uh, with Australia's position having very successfully, compared to many other countries, suppressed the virus, uh, we didn't receive as much as other countries in more emergency situations were, but we do know that the supply is coming online in very significant quantities. Fiona. Treasurer, you mentioned uh, the, the prospect of future lockdowns and restrictions. Isn't the slow vaccine rollout doing economic damage to Australia? Well, we are rolling out the vaccine, Fiona, as fast as we can. And the good news is that eight and a half million uh, doses have already been delivered, that on Monday, uh, we saw a record number for, for Monday uh, being delivered across the country. Uh, if you look at the first million doses, it was delivered in 45 days. Uh, if you look at the last million doses, I think it was delivered in eight to nine days. Um, we have dramatically reduced that time in which we are getting large numbers of the vaccine out to as many people as possible. And with that vaccine rollout, there have been challenges. And some of those challenges have been forced upon us. For example, the age cohort in which the AstraZeneca vaccine is available to us. Now, with respect to lockdowns, yes, they do cost the economy. There's no secret in that. Treasury had estimated that the Victorian lockdown was costing at least $100 million a day. The lockdown in New South Wales is of a slightly different nature. It's not across the whole state, uh, and there are uh, um, less uh, restrictive restrictions, if you like, that are in place in New South Wales compared to what we saw in Victoria. But it definitely dense confidence. And one of the real positives out of today's discussion was that we are incorporating business into the rollout plan for the vaccination and their role. And that can help build their confidence because they are the employers 
who are willing to take on new staff. They are the investors that are willing to purchase new equipment or, or undertake a new building. That is why their engagement, as well as the resources they bring to the table, is so important. Just, just, on, just, just on that, you talk about working with Treasury and business to remove barriers. What sort of barriers are you referring to? Is it sort of insurance, indemnity? Um, what sort of barriers are actually in place at the moment to prevent Oh, well, I mean, you've, you've seen it publicly reported, for example, uh, the Australian Industry Group has raised issues about indemnities, has raised issues about information sharing. Uh, we've, they've raised issues um, about incentives. There's a, there's a lot of things uh, it, that have been raised um, in the context of today's meeting that require follow-up. And the Chief Medical Officer made a commitment that where possible, he'll seek to clarify some of those rules um, where there was uncertainty. Uh, and you know, this is this is important to have this level of dialogue. Particularly, the CEOs were giving us first-hand experience of what they were seeing on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Why has it taken to now to sit down with business to try and sort out the vaccine rollout? And is this essentially you outsourcing your responsibility as a government to convince Australians? To get the jab. Well, as I said, we have partnered from day one very effectively and successfully with business. It's been a really important partnership that's seen our economic recovery take hold. With respect to business, my dialogue is with, with them has been ongoing. But with respect to the vaccine rollout, it has been subject to getting more supply online. And what the general spoke today about was where the numbers of vaccines are likely to be in August, September, in October. And that gives us more flexibility to bring in, uh, for example, workforce uh, uh, vaccinations. Uh, that is not uh, what is happening right now. Right now we're using the GPs, we're using uh, the, uh, the, the centres set up by the states. Um, that is the primary uh, mechanism for rolling out the vaccine. But as more supply comes on board, using the businesses uh, and their resources is going to be important. To, to that question, yeah. you know, businesses have been talking for the whole year about how they can help with the rollout. Jennifer Westercott said with the more time they can plan and then they can start vaccinating yeah. as soon as possible. So why didn't you start this conversation with them in this sort of format much earlier than now? Well, firstly, we do have regular dialogue with the business community. So, for example, Treasury have a business liaison unit that has been conducting regular discussions about the vaccine rollout, about the economic conditions, about a whole series of issues related to COVID. So, um, that is a the premise of that question is actually wrong in that we have been engaged with them from day one, including through this vaccine rollout. But with respect to today, it was about accelerating that involvement commensurate with the acceleration in the vaccine rollout. And as more supply uh, comes on board, the businesses can play a greater role. And of course, their advocacy about the importance of getting the jab is going to be vital. And you know, as as you said, as you said, specific sense of timing also, as you know, I've completed my review now. Yesterday, I was able to synchronise our revised plan with the states and territories. So today, I've had the opportunity to come to speak to business about exactly where we are in the rollout. So today is a, a fresh line in the sand. We're going to take two more questions. Yeah. Yeah. As you said, the, the original plan was GPs, pharmacies, state vaccination yes. clinics. What are their deficiencies that they won't be enough to rely on come September, October? Why are we having to pivot away from GPs and pharmacies and rely on as yet unformed plans from businesses? Well, firstly, um, General Fruin um, can add to this, but if you look abroad, um, they have, in, in America is a good example, they have been actively engaging the business community in the rollout. And they're not mutually exclusive. So just because you actively engage business and they have a role to play in workplace vaccinations doesn't mean there's no role to play for the GPs and the pharmacies. It's about having as many points of contact as possible so you can reach as many people as possible. So it's Let's, underestimation. No, it's, it's about what is consistent with the amount of supply that we have available. And as more supply becomes available, it opens up more opportunities to work with the business community as a point of contact. General? So Commonwealth GPs and hubs and state and territory clinics will remain the backbone of the plan. But I think as we get, especially into those later months, October, November, December, where 
uh, the supply that we will have and uh, the sort of it will be really important for people to have uh, a more diverse range of ways to access the, the vaccine. It will give us greater flexibility, it will give us greater choice, and it will give us greater convenience. Uh, well, later in the year, we will have additional Pfizer, we will have Moderna coming online as well. But in my look at the plan, there is a very strong backbone based on GPs, Commonwealth hubs and state hubs. These will be additional options that people will have. And I think uh, later in the year, the more convenience and the more flexibility we can offer people, that will just enhance the acceleration. <laughs> Treasurer, um, Kurt Campbell from the Biden administration says China, uh, Australia needs to settle in for a long period of tension with China, including ongoing economic coercion. What's your response to that? Well, we're definitely uh, living um, with a different China than we've seen uh, in years prior. And the, the China under Xi Jinping is very different to the China that Scott Morrison is dealing with, is very different to the China under Hu Jintao. Uh, that, uh, uh, that John Howard dealt with. Um, I remember well, I think it was in October 2003, when in the Australian Parliament, just 150 metres from here, we had in successive days, Mark, you'll remember it well, the President of the United States and um, the, uh, the President of China. Um, and gone are those days. There's a lot more strategic competition in the world. And China has been a lot more uh, assertive in not just its diplomacy, uh, but also in its other positions. We have seen across a range of issues um, the consequences of that assertiveness. And the federal government, the coalition government, under Prime Minister Morrison, under his predecessor Malcolm Turnbull, and before that Tony Abbott and John Howard, has consistently stood up for the national interest. Now, that has occurred in relation to telecommunications infrastructure. That's occurred in relation to the Belt and Road Initiative. That's in, occurred in relation to foreign interference in my own space. That's occurred in relation to foreign investment, where I've increasingly seen foreign investment applications that have been pursued not necessarily for commercial objectives, but for strategic objectives. And as you know, I've said no to applications that in the past may have been approved. And we passed through the parliament the most significant legislative changes to our foreign investment review framework in the last 50 years. That being said, all of that being said, China remains a very important economic partner for Australia. They've made no secrets of the fact that some of our exports are not making its way to China. Barley, wine, coal. But what is making its way to China, because they need it most, is our iron ore. And the price of iron ore is at near record highs. Uh, and that is providing you know, significant uh, revenue into our economy, both at a state and a federal level. But we will not put economic interests first. We will put the broader national interest first. And that means standing up with a very clear and consistent sense of where our national interest is and that is what we have done under Prime Minister Morrison. Treasurer, Thank you very much. Treasurer, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, did you misuse taxpayer funds over the